I have heard uh, what the Lord was doing out here at Talbot in the uh, philosophy program, but now I'm glad to see it with my own eyes. I'm very thrilled to be here and uh, actually very nervous to be speaking <laughs> to this audience. I feel like I can't live up to the expectations that JP has generated <laughs> by his kind remarks. But uh, I chose for my topic today uh, a discussion of God and his relationship to time. So let's get right to the topic and then we'll have a chance for discussion afterwards. Nicholas Lash has recently remarked that in the dialogue between theology and science, it has been the latter which has been doing most of the talking. Well, today I plan to talk back. As a theologian and philosopher, I'm committed to the enunciation of a synoptic worldview, which takes into account the theories and discoveries of modern science. In return, I believe that a theological perspective will also serve to shed surprising light on certain theoretical problems of modern physics. The conceptions of time and becoming are a case in point. <coughs> Most physicists and philosophers of science would probably agree with Wolfgang Rindler that with the development of relativity theory, Einstein took the step that would completely destroy the classical concept of time. Many would contend that along with a privileged universal time and absolute simultaneity, temporal becoming and an objective now must also go by the board. I believe such judgments to be mistaken and to be predicated upon a deficient understanding of the metaphysical and particularly theistic underpinnings of the classical concept of time, as well as a defective epistemological approach to these problems. In order to rediscover those foundations, let's then look afresh at Isaac Newton's concept of time. In the scolium to his definitions in the Principia, Newton drew a distinction between what he called absolute time and relative time. Newton's much misunderstood and greatly vilified distinction deserves thoughtful consideration. In order to overcome what he called common prejudices concerning such quantities as time, space, place, and motion, Newton draws a dichotomy with respect to these quantities between absolute and relative, true and apparent, mathematical and common. With regard to time, he asserts, absolute, true, and mathematical time, of itself and from its own nature, flows equally without relation to anything external, and by another name is called duration. Relative, apparent, and common time is some sensible and external, whether accurate or unequal, measure of duration by the means of motion, which is commonly used instead of true time, such as an hour, a day, a month, a year. Several aspects of this analysis deserve comment. The most evident feature of this distinction is the independence of absolute time from the sensible and relative measures thereof. Absolute time, or simple duration, exists regardless of the sensible and external measurements which we try, more or less successfully, to make of it. In other words, clock time may not be the true time. As Lucas puts it, Time is not what the clocks say, but what they are trying to tell, are there to tell. If we reject Newton's distinction, then the statement that two time intervals are congruent or equal can only be conventionally true. Without absolute time, our temporal metrics, as determined by, say, mechanical, gravitational, or electromagnetic clocks, may not stay in synchronization, and the unity of time becomes a mere assumption. Now, notice that Newton's distinction, as thus far explained, concerns only the absolute measured distinction, according to which true time is distinct from measured time. <coughs> 
But as is well known, Newton also conceived of time as absolute in a more profound sense, which is expressed in the absolute relational distinction. Namely, he held that time is absolute in the sense that it exists independently of any physical objects whatsoever. Usually this is interpreted to mean that time would exist even if nothing else existed. That there exists a possible world in which uh, that world is completely empty except for the container of absolute space and the flow of absolute time. But here we must be very careful. Modern secular scholars tend frequently to forget how ardent a theist Newton was and how central a role this theism played in his metaphysical outlook. Noting that Newton considered God to be temporal and therefore time to be everlasting, David Griffin observes that most commentators have ignored Newton's heterodox theology and his talk of absolute time has been generally misunderstood to mean that time is not, in any sense, a relation, and hence can exist apart from actual events. In fact, Newton made it quite clear in the general scolium to the Principia, which he added in 1713, that absolute time and space are constituted by the divine attributes of eternity and omnipresence. He wrote, God is eternal and infinite. That is, his duration reaches from eternity to eternity. His presence from infinity to infinity. He is not eternity and infinity, but eternal and infinite. He is not duration or space, but he endures and is present. He endures forever and is everywhere present. And by existing always and everywhere, he constitutes duration and space. Since every particle of space is always, and every indivisible moment of duration is everywhere, certainly the maker and lord of all things cannot be never and nowhere. Because God is eternal, there exists an everlasting duration. And because he is omnipresent, there exists an infinite space. Absolute time and space are therefore quasi-relational for Newton in that they are contingent upon the existence of God. With respect to physical time, what Newton did not realize, nor could he have suspected, is that physical time is not only relative, but also relativistic. That the approximation of physical time to absolute or metaphysical time depends not merely upon the regularity of one's clock, but also upon its motion. Unless a clock were at absolute rest, it would not accurately measure the passage of metaphysical time. Moving clocks run slow. This truth, unknown to Newton, only intimated by Larmor and Lorentz in their concept of local time, was finally grasped by Einstein. Where Newton fell short then was not in his analysis of absolute or metaphysical time. He had theological grounds for positing such a time. But in his incomplete understanding of physical time, he assumed too readily that an ideal clock would give an accurate measure of metaphysical time independently of its motion. If confronted with relativistic evidence, Newton would no doubt have welcomed this correction and seen therein no threat whatsoever to his doctrine of absolute time. In short, relativity theory corrects Newton's concept of physical time, not his concept of metaphysical time. In Newton's thinking, metaphysical time, God's time, is the foundation of becoming. Even should relations of absolute simultaneity not obtain in physical time, they do in metaphysical time. And God knows which events occur simultaneously, regardless of physical reference frames. God knows what is the absolute now of metaphysical time. Now this 
Newtonian research program was interrupted by Albert Einstein with his radically different approach. Foundational to Einstein's approach was his denial of absolute space and his consequent redefinition of time and simultaneity so as to deny their absolute status as well. What Einstein did, in effect, was to shave away Newton's metaphysical time and space, and along with them, the ether, thus leaving behind only their sensible measures, so that physical time became the only time there is, and physical space the only space there is. Since these are relativized to reference frames or inertial frames, one ends up with the relative, relativity of simultaneity and of length. Well, what justification did Einstein have for so radical a move? How did he know that metaphysical space and time do not exist? The answer, in a word, is positivism. Although one rarely finds this discussed in textbook expositions of the theory, or even in discussions of the philosophical foundations of the theory, nevertheless, historians of science have demonstrated convincingly that at the philosophical root of Einstein's theory lies an epistemological positivism of Machian provenance, that is, springing from Ernst Mach, which issues in a verificationist analysis of the concepts of time and space. When you look at Einstein's 1905 paper, we find that the introductory sections are predicated upon positivistic assumptions. Einstein's verificationism comes through most clearly in his operationalist uh, redefinitions of key concepts. Newton's distinction between time and the sensible measures thereof is quietly abolished. Einstein does not attempt to justify his positivism, it's just presupposed. It is taken for granted that all our judgments in which time plays a role must have a physical meaning, he asserts. Now we must bear carefully in mind that a mathematical description of this kind has no physical meaning unless we are quite clear as to what we will understand by time. The meaning of time is made to depend upon the meaning of simultaneity, which is defined locally in terms of occurrence of the same clock reading. When it comes to judgments concerning the simultaneity of distant events, the concern is to find a practical arrangement to compare clock times. In order to define a common time for spatially separated clocks, Einstein proposes that we adopt the convention that the time which light takes to travel from A to B equals the time that it takes to travel from B to A, a definition which presupposes that absolute space does not exist. Thus, time is reduced to physical time, clock readings, and space to physical space, readings of measuring rods. And both of these are relativized to local inertial frames. Simultaneity is defined in terms of clock synchronization uh, by using light signals. All of this is done by mere stipulation. Through Einstein's operational definitions of time and space, Mach's pro uh, positivism triumphs in the special theory of relativity. Reality is reduced to what our measurements read. Newton's metaphysical time and space, which transcend operational definitions, are implied to be mere figments of our imagination. Even subsequent to his development of the general theory of relativity, Einstein continued to regard absolute space and time as meaningless notions. In 1920, for example, he wrote, we thus require a definition of simultaneity such that this definition supplies us with the means by which, in the present case, the observer can decide by experiment whether both lightning strokes occurred simultaneously. As long as this requirement is not satisfied, I allow myself to be deceived as a physicist. And, of course, the same thing applies if I am not a physicist when I imagine 
that I am able to attach a meaning to the statement of simultaneity. For physicists and non-physicists alike, the statement that two events occur simultaneously is meaningless unless an operational definition can be given for that concept. Positivistic philosophers and physicists were quick to recognize in the special theory a kindred spirit and embrace the theory eagerly. Under the influence of positivism and the verificationist theory of meaning, uh, physicists and philosophers of space and time during the first half of this century openly expressed their abhorrence for what was called metaphysics. For most thinkers, time became synonymous with physical time. <clears throat> What then can be said of STR, the special theory of relativity, uh, uh, its elimination of metaphysical time and space? Well, the first thing to be noticed is that the positivism, which characterized the historical formulation of STR, belongs essentially to the philosophical foundations of the theory. The relativity of length depends upon the relativity of simultaneity which in turn rests upon Einstein's redefinitions of simultaneity in terms of clock synchronization via light signals. But that definition necessarily presupposes that the time which light takes to travel from A to B is the same as it takes to travel from B to A in a round trip journey. That assumption presupposes that A and B are not both in absolute motion together, or in other words, that neither metaphysical space nor a privileged rest frame exists. The only justification for that assumption is that it is empirically impossible to distinguish <coughs> uniform motion from rest relative to such a frame. And if metaphysical space and absolute motion or rest are undetectable empirically, therefore they do not exist and may even be said to be meaningless. Such an inference is clearly verificationist and therefore positivistic. In a clear-sighted analysis of the epistemological foundations of STR, Lawrence Sklar underlines the essential role played by this verificationism. He writes, certainly the original arguments in favor of the relativistic viewpoint were right with verificationist presuppositions about meaning and so forth. And despite Einstein's later disavowal of the verificationist point of view, no one, to my knowledge, has provided an adequate account of the foundations of relativity which isn't verificationist in essence. It would be desirable to do such a thing, muses Sklar, but what I don't know is either how to formulate a coherent underpinning for relativity which isn't verificationist to begin with, or how, once begun, to find a natural stopping point for verificationist claims of underdetermination and conventionality. But if positivism belongs essentially to the foundations of STR, the next thing to be noted is that uh, positivism has proved to be completely untenable and is now outmoded. The untenability of positivism is so universally acknowledged that it won't be necessary to rehearse the objections against it here. Richard Healy observes that positivism has come under such sustained attack that opposition to it has become almost orthodoxy in the philosophy of science. Positivism provides absolutely no justification for thinking that Newton erred, for example, in holding that God exists in a temporal series which transcends our physical measures of it, and which may or may not be registered by them. It matters not a whit whether we finite creatures know what time it is in God's metaphysical time. God knows, and that is enough. <coughs> Contemporary physics has, in any case, uh, ignored the constrictions of positivism. When the contemporary student of physics reads the anti-metaphysical polemics of the past generation, he must feel as though he were peering into a different world. It is now widely recognized that the boundaries of science are impossible to fix with any precision. And during the last few decades, theoretical physics 
has been characterized precisely by its metaphysical speculative character in various fields such as quantum mechanics, <coughs> classical cosmology, and quantum cosmology. Debates rage over issues which are overtly metaphysical in character. The point is that the positivistic, anti-metaphysical view of physics which dominated the first two-thirds of this century is simply outmoded in the light of contemporary theoretical physics. With the failure of positivism, one is quite free, especially if one is a theist, to make a distinction between physical time and space, that is, clock and rod measurements, and metaphysical time and space, ontological time and space, independent of physical measurements thereof. STR is a theory about physical time and space and says nothing about the nature of metaphysical time and space. Questions dealing with the latter are philosophical in nature and must be dealt with as such. One should insist that an exclusively physical methodology is simply inadequate to deal with the problems of time and space. All too often, physicists' failure to draw such a distinction has led them into faulty theological inferences. For example, P.C.W. Davies, author of God and the New Physics, observing that if a space-time singularity did exist at the Big Bang, as predicted by Friedman models, then it will be impossible to continue physics or physical reasoning through it to an earlier stage of the universe. He goes on to conclude from this that it is therefore meaningless to speak of God's creating the universe. For a cause, he says, must precede its effect temporally. But there is no temporal moment before the Big Bang. Therefore, the Big Bang can have no cause. But leaving aside the faulty premise that a cause must temporally precede its effect, if we draw a distinction between metaphysical time and physical time, it's quite evident that a beginning of physical time does not imply a beginning of metaphysical time. God in metaphysical time could be quite active prior to creation, uh, perhaps creating angelic realms, and could bring physical time and space into being after his having existed without their being coexistent with it. Or again, the uncertainty which quantum physics introduces into the time coordinate prior to the Planck time, that's about 10 to the negative 43 seconds after the Big Bang, this indeterminacy is exploited by Thomas Banks to draw a ma marvelous uh, metaphysical inference. Banks writes, as we enter this regime prior to the Planck time, the intuitive concept of time loses all meaning. There is no content in the question of what happened before the Big Bang, not because the universe becomes singular, but because quantum fluctuations invalidate the notion of absolute time. It's not explained, of course, how the indeterminacy of physical time is supposed to invalidate Newton's absolute time, which, based in God's eternity, ought to be distinguished from what are only sensible measures thereof, in Newton's words. Sometimes the metaphysical conclusions proclaimed on the basis of the positivistic analysis of time can be quite ludicrous. For example, in appealing to the invariance of quantum field theories under uh, consecutive reversals of time, charge, and space, Henrik Mailberg states, if all natural laws are time reversed invariant, and no irreversible processes occur in the physical universe, then there is no inherent, intrinsically meaningful difference between past and future, just as there is no such difference between to the left of and to the right of. If this is actually the case, then all mankind's major religions, which preach a creation of the universe by a supernatural agency, and imply accordingly a differentiation between the past and the future, that is, an intrinsic difference between both, would have to make an appropriate readjustment of man's major religious and creationist creeds and the scientific findings. This solemn and ridiculous pronouncement clearly rests upon the identification of God's time with physical time, a reduction which is positivistic in character. So 
I think that it's evident that the demise of positivism is not at all to be mourned, but that on the contrary, its lingering shadow over certain discussions of the concept of time has sometimes resulted in quite unjustified and erroneous metaphysical conclusions. We've seen then that for Newton, God's eternity and omnipresence were ontologically foundational for his views of time and space. Unfortunately, in our secular age, physicists and philosophers of space and time rarely, if ever, give careful consideration to the difference God's existence makes for our conceptions of time and space. Such indifference was characteristic of Einstein himself. On the other hand, his uh, contemporary Henri Poincaré, the brilliant French physicist, in a fascinating passage in his essay, The Measure of Time, does briefly entertain the hypothesis of what he called an intelligence infinie, that is, an infinite intelligence. And he considers the implications of such a hypothesis. He writes this. We should first ask ourselves how one could have had the idea of putting into the same frame of reference so many worlds impenetrable to one another. We should like to represent to ourselves the external universe, and only by so doing could we feel that we understood it. We know that we can never attain this representation. Our weakness is too great. But at least we desire the ability to conceive an infinite intelligence for which this representation could be possible, a sort of great consciousness which would see all and classify all in its time just as we classify in our time the little we see. What I have said, Poincaré continues, uh, uh, shows us perhaps why we have tried to put all the physical phenomena into the same frame. But that cannot pass for a definition of simultaneity, since this hypothetical intelligence, even if it existed, would be for us impenetrable. It is therefore necessary to seek somewhere else. Poincaré here suggests that in considering the notion of simultaneity, we instinctively put ourselves in the place of God and classify events as past, present, or future according to his time. Poincaré does not deny that such a perspective would disclose to us true relations of simultaneity. But he rejects the hypothesis uh, as yielding a definition of simultaneity because we could not know such relations. Such knowledge would remain the exclusive possession of God himself. But clearly, Poincaré's misgivings are relevant to a definition of simultaneity only if one is presupposing some sort of verificationist theory of meaning, as he undoubtedly was. The fact remains that God would know the absolute simultaneity of events, even if we grope in total darkness. Poincaré's hypothesis suggests, therefore, that God's present is constitutive of relations of absolute simultaneity. J.M. Findlay was wrong when he said, the influence which harmonizes and connects all the world lines is not God, not any featureless inert medium, but that living, active interchange called light, offspring of heaven firstborn. On the contrary, the use of light signals to establish clock synchrony is a convention which finite and ignorant creatures have been obliged to adopt, but the living and active God who knows all is not so dependent. As Milton K. Muniz points out, we can imagine a superhuman observer, a god, who is not bound by the limitations of the maximum velocity of light. Such an observer could survey in a single instant the entire domain of galaxies that have already come into existence. His survey would not have to depend on the finite velocity of light. It would not betray any restriction in information of the kind that results from the delayed time it takes to bring information about the domain of galaxies to an ordinary human observer situated in the universe and who is therefore bound by the mechanisms and processes of signal trans transmission. The entire domain of galaxies would be seen instantaneously by this privileged superhuman observer. 
his observational survey of all galaxies would yield what Milne calls a world map. In God's temporal experience, there is a moment which is present in metaphysical time, wholly independently of physical clock times. He would know without any dependence on clock synchronization procedures or any physical operations at all, which events were simultaneously present in metaphysical time. He would know this simply in virtue of his knowing at every such moment the unique set of present tense propositions true at that moment without any need of a sensorium or a physical observation of the universe. Now, the question presses, how then does God's metaphysical time relate to our physical time? Well, from what has been said thus far, it seems that God's existence in metaphysical time and his real relation to the world would imply that a Lorentz Poincaré theory of relativity is correct after all, as opposed to an Einsteinian theory of relativity. Uh, that is to say, a theory of relativity in which there does exist a privileged rest frame, absolute simultaneity, and clocks and rods in motion relative to this privileged frame uh, experience distortions due to dynamical causes uh, as a result of their motion. Such a theory, I think, is implied by the existence of God in metaphysical time. For God, in the now of metaphysical time, would know which events in the universe are now being created by him and are therefore absolutely simultaneous with each other and with his now. This startling conclusion shows that Newton's theistic hypothesis is not some idle speculation, but has important implications for our understanding of how the world is and for the assessment of rival scientific theories. A final issue now needs to be engaged, and that is whether we have some idea of which measured time coincides with God's metaphysical time. Or in other words, what clock time is the true time? The answer to this question will take us from special into general relativity theory as we seek to gain a cosmic perspective on time. In the general theory of relativity, there is a unique cosmic time which measures the proper time of the duration of the universe. And that is why scientists, for example, say that the universe is approximately 15 billion years old. That is an estimation in cosmic time, the proper time of the age of the universe. And it's my contention that since the inception of the universe and the beginning of physical time, this cosmic time coincides with God's metaphysical time, that is, with Newton's absolute time. It therefore provides the correct measure of God's time and is thus the true time, in contrast to the multiplicity of local times registered by clocks in motion relative to the cosmological uh, rest frame. Already in 1920, on the basis of Einstein and de Sitter's cosmological models, Sir Arthur Eddington hinted at a theological interpretation of cosmic time. This is what Eddington wrote. In the first place, absolute space and time are restored for phenomena on a cosmical scale. The world, taken as a whole, has one direction in which it is not curved. That direction gives a kind of absolute time distinct from space. Relativity is reduced to a local phenomenon. And although this is quite sufficient for the theory hitherto described, we are inclined to look upon the limitation rather grudgingly. But we have already urged that the relativity theory is not concerned to deny the possibility of an absolute time, but to deny that it is concerned in any experimental knowledge yet found. And it need not perturb us if the conception of absolute time turns up in a new form in a theory of phenomena on a cosmical scale as to which no experimental knowledge is yet available. Just as each limited observer has his own particular separation of space and time, so a being coextensive with the world might well have a special separation of space and time 
natural to him. It is the time for this being that is here dignified by the title absolute. A couple of items in this remarkable paragraph deserve comment. First, Eddington rather charitably interprets STR as positing a merely epistemic limitation on our temporal notions rather than an ontological limitation on time and space. But as friend and foe alike have emphasized, STR requires metaphysical, not merely epistemological commitments concerning the non-existence of absolute space and time. Otherwise, one winds up with a Lorentz Poincaré interpretation of the theory, which is in truth the position that Eddington is describing. Secondly, notice that Eddington is quite willing to call cosmic time absolute in virtue of its independence from space. That is to say, uh, it is not bound up with the uh, spatial coordinates. Relativistic time is, as Lorentz and Poincaré maintain, only a local time, whereas cosmic time being non-local is the true time. Thirdly, although in 1920, when Eddington wrote this, there was no empirical evidence for cosmic time, within a few short years, the astronomical evidence confirmed the prediction of the Friedman model of a universal expansion, and hence, of cosmic time. The veil of epistemic limitation had been torn away. Finally, notice that Eddington says this cosmic time would be the time of an omnipresent being whose reference frame is the universe itself. Is Eddington here recalling Poincaré's infinite intelligence who classified everything according to his universal frame of reference, his world map, just as finite observers classify events according to their local frames? Cosmic time is not merely the fusion of all the proper times recorded by separate individuals at rest in this cosmic frame, but even more fundamentally, it is the time which measures the duration of the omnipresent being who coexists with the universe. As the measure of the proper time of the universe, cosmic time also measures the duration of and lapse of time for a temporal being coextensive with the world. For Eddington, it is the time of this being that deserves to be called absolute. Well, I think the theological application is obvious. Given the existence of cosmic time, it's my contention that the moments of God's metaphysical time, while perhaps not identical with the moments of physical cosmic time, are nevertheless coincident with them. Um, such times are not identical because uh, God's time could have preceded cosmic time. Nevertheless, it seems to me that they coincide throughout the duration of cosmic time. Uh, how could this be denied? When we recall that God is causally related to the cosmos, sustaining it in being moment by moment, then it seems difficult to deny that the duration measured by cosmic time is also the measure of God's temporal being. If the duration of the universe measured in cosmic time is 15 billion years since the singularity, then isn't the duration of God's creative activity in metaphysical time also 15 billion years? In God's now, the universe has certain specific and unique properties. For example, a certain radius, a certain density, a certain temperature background, and so forth. But in the cosmic now, it has all the identical properties. And so it is with every successive now. Isn't it obvious that these nows coincide and designate one and the same present? Perhaps we can state this consideration a little more formally by means of the following principle. And I'll propose this, this principle, which I call P. For any constantly and non-recurrently changing universe, U, and temporal intervals, X and Y, large enough to permit change, if the physical description of U at X is the same as the physical description of U at Y, then X and Y coincide. Given that in metaphysical time there is a temporal interval or duration during which a certain physical description of the universe is true, and that in cosmic time a similar interval exists, and it follows from this principle P that those intervals of time coincide. And therefore it seems to me that God's time and cosmic time 
ought naturally to be regarded as coincident since the moment of creation. In conclusion, then, we've seen that once you move from the special theory into the general theory, the application of the latter theory of cosmology yields a cosmic time which is plausibly regarded as being the measured time which coincides with God's time and is therefore the true time. In summary, then, we've seen that in virtue of God's temporal duration, Newton correctly distinguished between metaphysical time and physical time. Newton's shortcoming lay not in his analysis of metaphysical time, but in his failure to realize that physical time is relativistic. Einstein's special theory did nothing to disprove the existence of metaphysical or absolute, uh, metaphysical time or absolute simultaneity. Rather, his pairing away of absolute time was rooted in a positivistic epistemology of Machian providence, a verificationist philosophy which is both philosophically untenable and wholly out of step with contemporary physics and philosophy of science. Moreover, we saw that this positivism belongs essentially to the philosophical foundations of the theory and, in fact, serves to distinguish it from the Lorentz Poincaré interpretation of the mathematical core of STR. The almost universally acknowledged failure of <coughs> positivism permits one to adhere rationally to a doctrine of metaphysical time and objective becoming independent of physical measures. Nothing compels us to adopt Einstein's interpretation of either the mathematics of this theory or of the relevant experimental data. If God exists in metaphysical time and temporally causes the successive states of the world, then the now of metaphysical time demarcates a three-dimensional slice of space-time which is equally now. This universal frame of reference would thus be privileged so that the events which God knows to be present in it are absolutely simultaneous. What the privileged status of such a frame implies is that a neo-Lorentzian interpretation of the special theory is correct after all. In this frame, absolute length, absolute motion, and absolute simultaneity obtain and are known to God. And rods and clocks in motion relative to it undergo intrinsic contraction and retardation. And finally, we've seen that in order to discover which physical time corresponds with God's metaphysical time, it's necessary to explore the time concept in the general theory of relativity. That theory, when given a cosmological application, discloses that in models which are causally well-behaved, like our universe, there is a universal cosmic time which records the proper time or duration of the universe. This cosmic time is plausibly regarded as coincident with metaphysical time subsequent to the moment of creation. Okay, well, that's the remarks that I wanted to share, and we have now, I guess, about uh, 25 minutes of discussion. So, who would like to raise a, a question or comment? Yes? I take it that <coughs> when Newton made a distinction between absolute time, which is uh, duration, versus measure of duration, it seems to me that there is an implicit distinction between metaphysics and epistemic access. In which case, if Einstein came along and tried to get rid of the metaphysical time by reducing it to, say, an empirical epistemic access, he is committing some type of, there's a problem, right, if you conflate those two? I don't think that the difference between absolute and relative time is just a matter of epistemic access for Newton. Because he did think that if you had a, an ideal clock which was at absolute rest, that it would, in fact, record the lapse of absolute time, that it would give you a correct measure of absolute time. Uh, and indeed, he gave certain experiments, like his famous uh, bucket experiment, uh, or the experiment of two rotating spheres, where he thought you could disclose absolute motion, for example, uh, that there were certain types of motions, such as rotary motion or centrifugal forces which would disclose to us absolute motion, not merely relative motion. So I don't think it was just a matter of epistem epistemic access. In certain cases, Newton thought we could perceive these absolute quantities. 
Rather, the difference was between the reality itself and the ways we try to measure it by physical devices like clocks and, and uh, meter sticks and so forth. Um, and he thought that since clocks and meter sticks are not ideal, but sometimes go wrong and, and so forth, that uh, very often we use things or measurements of time that are not accurate, but are only approximations of true time. But in contemporary philosophy of time and space, you'll find that this physicalistic understanding of time and space is implicitly what is being talked about. They don't even make the distinction anymore. It's just the presupposition, if you pick up a book on philosophy of time and space, that you're talking about this operationally defined quantity rather than a, a reality in itself. Yes? And Okay, thank you for that. Um, I also have a question about some of the theological ramifications of this distinction. It seems to me that when you hold to a distinction between metaphysical time and physical time, such that you describe God's moments of knowledge and knowing that that's say. Could you use that in uh, formulating some counter-arguments to say fatalism, theological fatalism? For instance, if God knows that agent Q will perform X at time T sub one, uh, some people say then, well, the agent must. Yes. Whereas if you hold to the distinction between metaphysical time uh, qua God's perspective versus our attempt as finite beings to kind of measure time, can it be said that we're warranted only in asserting that agent X will do? Or well, I guess I don't see that uh, making this kind of distinction would be real helpful because on this view, on the Newtonian sort of view, God does have genuine for knowledge in the sense that the events that are, are future in metaphysical time are absolutely future. They're not just future relative to some reference frame. They're absolutely future. Now, by absolutely, I don't mean fatalistically future. I just mean that it's not a relation, that uh, there is an absolute present and events later than that have not yet transpired. So that if God knows that they're going to happen, you're going to, you, you have to face the fatalistic argument. Uh, how then are they still contingent if God knows things in his metaphysical future? Now, I'm persuaded that the argument for theological fatalism is just uh, fallacious, that you have to formulate a way in which God's beliefs about the future are somehow necessary in virtue of their being past. And I don't think any fatalist has successfully drafted a theory of that kind of temporal necessity under which God's beliefs would turn out to be um, facts which would be counterfactually independent of the free actions that would take place in the future. And by that I mean it seems to me that we have the power as free agents to act in such a way that if we were to act in that way, God's beliefs would have been different. That doesn't mean we have the power to change God's beliefs, but we do have the power to act in such a way that God's beliefs would have been different. So it seems to me that, that while this doesn't help with the argument for fatalism, I don't think that argument is a, a, a problem anyway. I don't think that fatalism goes through, even on a theological level. JP? A couple of uh, things I'd like you to clarify, Bill. Uh, in your view now, is there a beginning to metaphysical time? And more generally, yeah. can you talk about your understanding of God's relationship to metaphysical time? Is God timeless? What was God mm -hmm. timeless? And then he, yeah. could you discuss that a little bit? My, my own view, is not exactly Newtonian, as you know. Uh, and in that sense, I may have been a little bit misleading. Newton believed that both time and space were infinite. And I don't accept that. I think that, in fact, time and space are finite. Uh, so the, the place at which I would take issue with Newton is, why do we think that God's existence would require the existence of an endless or a beginningless time. And it seems to me that, that there's no need for that. If you adopt some sort of a relational view of time, 
according to which, in the total absence of events, there is no time, then if God exists changelessly, without creation, alone, by himself, then God existing in such a state would be timeless. I don't see any reason to think that in the total absence of change, that there would be, um, there would be the lapse of time. And so, on my own understanding, I would say that God, without creation or without the universe existing by himself, exists timelessly. And that with the occurrence of the first event, which is the moment of creation, uh, God enters into time and sustains temporal relationships with creatures. Now, where that beginning of time occurred, nobody really knows. It's convenient to say at the Big Bang because that's when physical space and time began. But theoretically, as I say, he could have been making these angelic realms prior to the moment of the Big Bang. I don't know. But my own conviction would be that God enters into time at the first moment of time, at the moment of the first event, and is thereafter temporal. So my view would be quasi-Newtonian uh, based upon a, a sort of relational view of what constitutes time. Earlier, you seemed to indicate, that I, I thought I heard you say, tell, tell me if this is wrong, you seemed to indicate that, that change presupposed duration or time. And it seemed like I now heard you say that the reason that God would be uh, timeless is because there would be no change. Um, do you see one as more fundamental than the well, other? Well, the latter would be my own view. I can't remember what it would have been that would lead you to think of the other, unless I was explicating maybe Newton's idea of there is this absolute duration and then we use uh, physical devices that change to try to record this duration. Maybe that's what so it was. you would say change is fundamental and then time is a measure of change? I wouldn't say time is a measure of change. Or relation. Or, yeah, it, that it's, it is a, an entity that arises concomitantly with the existence of change. Um, and that would be the point at which I would take issue with Newton. He doesn't give any kind of argument or proof to show that God's mere existence entails that that existence must be temporal. And I don't see why it would. I mean, philosophers are, are very content, as you know, to talk about many sorts of timelessly existing entities, abstract objects, and so forth. And if God is just a changeless being, I don't see any reason to think that that has to be a temporal form of existence. So. I would say that God existing alone without creation is timeless, and then he, he initiates time and enters into time at the moment of creation. Could you say something about the relationship between that claim, that God is timeless when he exists all by himself as a changeless being, and uh, the first event, especially in response to Davies, you know, Paul Davies, yeah. He says, because it's the first event, there's no before, then you don't need a cause. Uh, or you can't have a cause. You can't have a cause. You can't even have one. Uh, you can't require one, certainly. Uh, now, I'm, I'm forgetting exactly how you respond to that and why now the claim that God is timeless up to that point. So okay, to yeah, so to speak. <laughs> inverted commas. Yeah. Um, it seems to me that Davies and others like him who have pushed this objection are forgetting an obvious way between the horns of the dilemma. And that is to say that God's creation of the universe is simultaneous with the origin of the universe. Mm -hmm. So that the cause need not be temporally prior to its effect. It can be simultaneous with the effect. And we experience simultaneous causation all the time. Uh, Kant gave a famous example of a heavy ball resting on a cushion. Uh, being a, a uh, cause of a depression in the cushion. And the ball and the cushion could have existed in that form from all eternity. There never had, had to be a beginning, theoretically I'm speaking here. And yet you would still say that the ball is the cause of the depression, even though the cause and the effect are, are simultaneous. So as long as it makes sense to talk about simultaneous causation, I would say that God's creation of the universe would be a prime instant right. of simultaneous causation and occurs at the, for convenience sake, at the moment of the singularity, the big thing. 
But weren't you willing to leave aside his, his false assumptions about the direction of causation and answer them? Oh, yes, yes. Way? What I said was there, I said leaving aside the faulty assumption that a cause has to precede its effect yes. in time. I said he erred in thinking that because physical time began at the Big Bang, that God couldn't have existed prior to the Big Bang in metaphysical time. Not physical time. Now, how do you relate that to the claim that God is timeless? Well, this would relate to the point I was just saying here. Suppose that the first event was God's creation of the angels, and then he created the physical universe of the Big Bang. Well, then God would be in metaphysical time from the very first moment of his uh, first creative act, which would be the creation of the angels. So that in that case, time would begin at the moment of the angelic creation rather than at the moment of the universe's creation. Okay, but then that, that strategy would not be available if he said, well, then let's go back and talk about the creation of the what angelic. is literally the first event. Yeah, fair enough. That's right. That's, that, if he said, well, then how could God cause the angelic realms unless he existed prior to that, right. then you're right. I, I would. Yeah. But is, I'm thinking that's probably the spirit of his uh, objection. True, true. I suppose you're right. Although I, I guess that to me, it, it just struck me that if there was a kind of reductionism going on here where they just equate physical time with metaphysical time and think that because physical time began at the Big Bang that God couldn't have existed before the Big Bang. And in fact, he could. In this recent debate with Grunbaum that uh, I published in the Philosophia Naturalis, I also defend a sort of Newtonian view where saying if you're a Newtonian, then this isn't a problem for you because you've got time prior to the moment of creation. Now, I myself think that even that metaphysical time began to exist, but it does, I think, show that at least this physical reductionistic view is wrong. Yeah. But you're right, you're right, it's fair enough. Ultimately, you're going to have to get to the point where I think one would appeal to simultaneous. You still have to uh, question his assumptions about the yeah. temporal Yes, I think that's right. So we just have a few minutes left, and, I, and I, I'll let some students come up afterwards, but we shift gears a bit. Uh, could you give us some advice? We have a lot of students here that uh, some of them want to want to serve Christ in apologetic ministries. Others, a lot of them want to go on for PhDs in philosophy. And is there any, just your assessment of what's happening out there, is wow. there, this may be tough for you, I don't mean to catch you. Yes, off you can catch off guard here a little bit. But, um, what are you seeing out there? Are there things that you think we need to be going into for the cause of Christ? Uh, well, I'll, I'll share one, one concern of mine, maybe, okay? Yeah, yeah, this is just a concern. I was reading recently uh, this book edited by Tom Morris uh, in which various famous Christian philosophers give their journeys of faith, so to speak, how they came to become Christians. And I think the thing that distressed me as I read this book was the theological heterodoxy of so many of our brethren in this discipline. Uh, you know, Marilyn Adams' essay in particular, I found very distressing, you know, where she says that uh, things like homosexual relationships are a reflection of the love of the Trinity, you know, the inner Trinitarian, you know, fellowship among the first. Yeah. <laughs> and, and, other, other aspects where the theology is not good, and I guess one of the concerns I have as an evangelical philosopher is that we not only be good philosophers, but that we be good theologians as well, and that we are careful to be steeped in the history of Christian doctrine and of the church uh, and in the knowledge of the scriptures as well. I got the impression from reading these articles that a lot of these folks really didn't have a whole lot more understanding of theology than maybe what they had gotten in Sunday school as, as a kid. And then growing up and having come to faith in Christ as philosophers, they began sort of to philosophize about these things without perhaps adequate doctrinal underpinnings. And so I would encourage you folks, while you're in the context of a, a graduate school in theology, to take advantage of the theological faculty here, as well as the philosophy faculty. This is an opportunity for you to do things like get your biblical Greek, take your history of doctrine and dogmatics, and be well grounded in systematics. And I think that that combination is very, very much needed on the present scene among 
Christian philosophers were making tremendous inroads, I think, against secularism in the <coughs> academy and the university. But this victory won't really be complete if it's not accompanied by an orthodox theology. So this would be perhaps one of my concerns that I might share. Are there areas of study in philosophy that, that you're sensing that we need to move people into? <coughs> that's, a, that's a bad question, probably. But just on, what comes to that? That's, that's a difficult one yeah. for me to answer. Until recently, I would have said this very area I was talking about now is the, the philosophy of space and time, for example, has been underrepresented. But now we've got some guys going into that, people like Alan Padgett and Brian Leftow and so forth. Though heretofore, we've certainly been underrepresented there. I would suppose maybe philosophy of biology would be one. We need some folks who understand evolutionary theory real well and can deal with folks like a Michael Roos and so forth. So uh, perhaps someone in philosophy of biology, philosophy of psychology, I think, would be another area where we could use Christians. Now, these aren't areas that I'm into, but I certainly sense the deficits there. Uh, those would be a couple of things. Oh, yeah? <laughs> oh, great. Praise the Lord. Well, Bill, thank you so much. Good